Thank you very much, Mavis. Uh, and thank you for the people both here and online who are participating. Um, what I'd like to do is to outline now, um, with the help of a few PowerPoint slides, um, to describe why um, we undertook the study, um, what we studied, uh, and to look at how we studied the, the, the methodology uh, as well. And then to go into a little bit more detail on some of the findings. Um, and so, firstly, the purpose, why, why is this important? So I think Mavis outlined the importance of accountability and accountability mechanisms um, very succinctly. Um, and many of us would say, well, accountability is important because it just is. It's doing the right thing is, 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 is so important. But there are also um, very good moral reasons. Um, there's very good financial reasons, social reasons. Um, accountability um, and ensuring uh, accountability mechanisms exist uh, in relief and development programs it is, without, is without doubt important. But the question that, that we were trying to um, understand better is, fine, they're important, but actually what do they contribute? What do they contribute to project quality? Um, what do they contribute to impact? And it was that question which there really was amongst the relief and development sector uh, a real lack of knowledge and evidence around. And so it was that gap that we were trying to fill. And where the question came from was a, was a group associated with, with the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, which came together to say, we know this is important, but we don't have the information, um, the evidence that, that tells us why. Um, and so how can we, we work together um, to fill the gap? And so what we initially did, in terms of the, the how we did it, um, what we initially did was to um, come together as a group, a peer learning group, to look at what, a, what, um, what evidence existed from the plethora of evaluations and case studies and vignettes um, to see what evidence existed uh, around the contribution um, that accountability mechanisms made um, to project quality. Uh, so we started with a literature review. Um, from that then developed uh, a methodology um, which included both quantitative and qualitative uh, methods um, and a process by which we would try to answer the question and build the evidence base. Um, we piloted uh, that methodology uh, in um, Kenya first, uh, a Christian aid program in Kenya, uh, and then after that in Myanmar, a program run by um, Save the Children Fund. Uh, and then that led to uh, a degree of analysis and reflection and, and, and the report which has been published in the last days and which is available, I think, online as well. Um, so that's an introduction into, into really what the motivation for doing the piece of work uh, and filling the gap. In terms, perhaps, of the how, how we did it. So the approach we took had two stages. Our, the key area of interest was in the three HAP benchmarks, benchmark three, four, and five, benchmark three being uh, accountability mechanisms uh, are those which firstly provide information um, about projects, about the nature of projects to people who are involved in those projects. Secondly, that elicit the participation of people involved in projects. And thirdly, offer a recourse for people to raise complaints uh, and get redress. So we focused on the th those three uh, HAP benchmarks um, as guiding the research. And then spent some time within the peer learning group looking, trying to think through our assumptions of how those um, three benchmarks contribute to improve quality. Um, and we spent a, a half day brainstorming ways in which we thought they contributed to project quality. Um, and used that as a basis to develop a framework um, which, which then the, the, the research followed on. In terms of the stages that we took, um, it was a two-stage process. The first stage, really, in terms of determining, was, was to determine uh, how effective or the functioning of, a, of an accountability mechanism. So how effective, how well did an accountability mechanism work? It's easy to say, well, the mechanism exists, and therefore it will have impact, it will, it will increase quality. But actually, I think we all know from our experience that 
uh, accountability mechanisms differ. They differ by an incredible amount. Different agencies have different approaches. They need to um, take into account context. They need to be context specific. So there was an important first step of trying to understand the level of functioning um, of an accountability mechanism with a view then our assumption was that dependent on that level of functioning, it would have a different, it would have a variable contribution, it would make a variable contribution to, um, to project quality. So a good, to, to simplify things, a good accountability mechanism, one would assume, would have a greater impact <coughs> or have, make a greater contribution to project quality than a modest, a medium, or a, or a poor accountability mechanism was. So the first stage was really to gauge the level of functionality of an accountability mechanism. And to do that, we used um, a tool that, to be honest, was, was developed first by Mango and Concern Worldwide, the Listen First uh, methodology, which we then adapted um, slightly to make it um, work better in this, for this particular piece of research. So that was step one. The second step then really having worked, uh, having gauged the level of, of functionality of an accountability mechanism, was to then ask the question, well, how does that contribute to, to the quality of projects? And we did that using the OECD DAC criteria, um, which, which is fairly, fairly well known and considered a benchmark, certainly in the humanitarian development <laughs> sector. Um, so looking at the four criteria of relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability which we assumed together would contribute to uh, or would have impact. And so in terms of then how we um, looked at the contribution, um, we did it for a number of qualitative exercises. Um, firstly, um, through uh, scorecard uh, exercises um, that were done with, through community um, groups. And then secondly, um, for opinion ranking exercises. Uh, and in terms of the types of projects we visited uh, and we spent time looking at, um, the Kenya project was where we piloted the methodology, um, was a Christian aid um, project which was um, uh, delivered through their partner, UCCS, um, uh, and then conducted on the ground by a CBO. Uh, and it was a resilience program in an area where UCCS had been working for a long time. So good experience and knowledge of the community um, uh, and uh, certainly a good background uh, in, the region, in, in that area. The second case study was in Myanmar, um, was working with Save the Children Fund, uh, again in an area where Save the Children Fund had uh, a, a, a good degree of knowledge and good links with the community, but directly, um, directly managed from Save the Children to uh, a CBO, which um, they had assisted in the development of. So they were the, the two case studies. Um, and then in terms of then actually delivering the methodology, it was very much based around focus group discussions, um, small groups of between 15 and 20 people, um, by myself as an independent researcher and, um, importantly, a colleague who was facilitating from the local area. Um, and um, it was a slightly different approach in the two case studies, but certainly for Kenya we had mixed groups of people. In Myanmar we had separate um, male groups, female groups, and we also um, adapted the methodology to be relevant to discussion with um, children as well. So we did slightly better at adapting the methodology there to get disaggregated data. So that's a, an idea around the kind of how we did it and, and the approach. And it's important to say that, that in addition to the findings, which, which, which we consider are extremely important, the approach um, is also um, of key importance in, in offering agencies um, a means of replicating um, the research and building the evidence base. That was a, a specific um, focus of the research, uh, was on developing something that we could offer up as public goods. In terms of some of the findings, um, just running through the four criteria, in terms of the relevance, I mean, again, a lot of this, and I should, I should preface this by saying a lot of this, it's, it's not necessarily new to us. We know this, but the contribution that, that the research makes is really, um, is really building evidence of this and finding the evidence, and that's what we're really offering to, to, the, to the relief and development community. So 
Accountability helped agencies understand needs and strengthen the utility of projects. There was overwhelming feedback from communities that um, through their participation in programs um, uh, and, and through having the ability to work with agency staff, um, th they were able to, to pass on um, information about, about the project. They, they were able to own projects um, and, and understand the needs much more significantly. I think it also helped um, the communities also said that by um, their use of accountability mechanisms, they also strengthened um, the targeting of programs. So because of that, and there are examples of, um, a couple of examples I could give from Myanmar, um, through the participation of communities, they were able to identify um, specific areas of need where, where there was greater need for water, uh, and, and that led to the particular location of one of the dams, which um, Christian Aid was building or alternatively through discussion with communities they identified the most vulnerable communities uh, the most vulnerable people in communities and so it has strengthened the targeting uh, and so a couple of tangible examples of how um, through accountability mechanisms through participation of people in projects um, targeting um, was strengthened and the needs base of assistance was was also strengthened and in that way um, strengthen the quality um, of the program. In terms of effectiveness, what came out, I think in all of the villages that we discussed, uh, we had discussions with, was that because agencies have provided information about projects, because people had um, contributed to designing projects and implementing them as well, um, uh, and because when there were problems or when there was uh, uncertainties, they were able to raise concerns and raise queries. Um, there was far greater trust. There was this trust dividend which was developed. Uh, and that was really important in terms of ownership, um, community ownership in projects. And that ownership led to um, a, a greater dividend, a, a, um, I guess, a sort of. A, a, I guess people appreciated and were able to um, be involved to a far greater extent in the projects as a consequence of that. Um, and also, what, what also came out was the fact that, was that communities felt that they knew better than agencies and people coming outside. They felt that they, because they understand the context better, there's a consequence of their involvement in making decisions about the projects, um, that they were, they, they were better better quality projects as a result. And I, I think it's important to say their perceptions was that quality was around improved quality. I didn't look, I didn't evaluate the technical aspects of projects, but certainly the, the perception of communities was that it was more important, it was more relevant to their needs. Um, and then finally, and very practically, we had a couple of instances where um, there was um, demonstration that the complaints mechanism specifically had led to fraud and mismanagement, <coughs> or mismanagement rather than fraud um, being highlighted. Um, and then th a very practical contribution made to the quality uh, um, of the project. Going on to efficiency and value for money, and I should say that for the for, for for various reasons, the two case studies didn't offer immediate um, examples where efficiency or where value for money had been strengthened, but the broader literature review, which the peer learning group um, contributed to, did. And there was a particularly good example, I think, from uh, Myanmar, where because an agency had discussed and had talked with a community uh, about procurement practices, um, it had um, earmarked a particular place to procure timber and paddy, um, uh, and it had set about the process of procuring it, and through its engagement with the community, actually uh, they discovered that procuring locally through a different means would have yielded a much um, cheaper um, much cheaper timber, much cheaper paddy, as well as stimulating local trade. And so there was almost a double um, benefit there from... Um, the participation of the community um, uh, 
uh, in the project. Um, and secondly, project monitoring also came out, and I think this came out quite strongly in the um, Kenya project, um, where the community was tasked with both the management of um, procurement, management of supplies, um, oversaw some of the work of contractors, um, and also um, were, were responsible for day-to-day -day monitoring activities. And what came out quite strongly then was because of their interest and ownership of a project and because they were there on a day-to-day -day basis and because, um, because it was creating something for them, um, the na there was extremely strong monitoring and there's evidence as well from the literature review around monitoring practices um, being strengthened, contractors being more closely managed um, and as a consequence greater efficiencies being achieved um, through the participation of communities. So again, a sort of link between participation um, uh, and efficiency. On sustainability, it's really followed on from some of the um, contribution, some of the issues around relevance. Um, because communities found um, projects more relevant to their needs, because they were more, in the community's view, successful in um, um, providing um, important services or support and in um, meeting the needs of, of the most vulnerable people, um, then they had greater ownership of the projects. And greater ownership, in, in, in their view, um, gave the potential for greater sustainability. And it was interesting, we got some, some very powerful quote, quote, quotations from community members around the fact that um, they felt the projects were very um, relevant. They could see that, 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 that they had the potential to offer a lot to communities. Um, uh, uh, they knew also that they weren't entirely sustainable at the moment, but they, but they had a, a, a passion to sustain them. They also um, were working with the agency around the journey towards sustainability. And again, I think um, the fact that, um, that, that the agency had built up a rapport through the participation um, of, of community members in the project um, had, had, made, had, had strengthened the sustainability uh, and again showed this, this link between um, the mechanism and the participation on the one hand um, and the contribution it made to project quality on the other. And important, um, most important, some, some issues around impact that came up and we were a little bit hesitant around the use of the word impact uh, and whether we would be able to get beyond um, proving or, or, or finding evidence of a contribution of accountability mechanisms to, to to, to quality, to, to move on to impact. And there was some, some very interesting examples of, of community that, particularly with, um, in Myanmar, um, referring to because they had, had, had participated in accountability mechanisms, they'd seen how they'd worked, they'd thought through and been involved in the provision of information, they'd participated in projects and seen the benefits of that, and they'd um, worked with established complaints <coughs> mechanisms then they had a sense of, 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 of how they could work elsewhere. And, and there were instances where communities had claimed their rights from other duty bearers. Um, and there were, com there were um, both within communities, and there was um, examples given how community development committees had strengthened their practice to be more accountable to, people, to members of the community, how funds, um, village fundraising committees, had um, instigated new mechanisms around um, transparency and information sharing based on what lessons that they had learned, um, but also with private institutions as well. There was a particular example in Myanmar where um, because of the experience uh, that communities had in raising complaints and the expectation uh, 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 and also the fact that complaints then had been um, listened to and responded to, that they, they use that methodology with, with a bank, a cooperative bank, uh, and with other duty bearers. And whilst it hadn't immediately yielded results, it was a work in progress. They'd engaged, they knew their rights, and, 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 and I think there was some quite powerful impacts, both anticipated and un un unanticipated, um, as a consequence of exposure to accountability mechanisms, which are really quite exciting. And I think, fundamentally, this 
somewhat nebulous issue around empowerment. I think, I think there were the communities demonstrated and, and, and articulated the fact that, that as a consequence, partially as a consequence, not wholly, of, 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 the account of their use of and exposure to an understanding of accountability mechanisms, um, they did feel empowered to, to claim rights from their rights from elsewhere. So that's a sort of highlight of the of some of the fine of some of the, the immediate findings against each of the, the criteria. Now, what through conducting the methodology, it was a learning process. You know, a group of people got together to try and work through a methodology that would be appropriate to. Um, to assessing the contribution um, of accountability mechanisms. So there's a lot of uh, learning which came out of that. Um, firstly, um, quite practical, and, and, uh, and again, perhaps not rocket science, but the importance of using entry points. And we kicked around the pros and cons of, um, of, of um, working specifically with agencies and going into communities with agencies and the, the potential impact that had on the independence of the evaluate of, of the um, research team, but what we found is that agencies played a really important gatekeeper role um, in terms of providing access and then um, withdrawing to allow myself and, and the researcher to then have a degree of freedom uh, and to allow a degree of um, sort of discussion which, which, which wasn't immediately, um, in, in which the agencies didn't participate, which allowed people to speak a little bit more freely. So extremely important, the, the sort of both the gatekeeping role, but also then the independence um, and the facilitation, um, absolutely fundamental. So certainly very little to do with me and far much more to do with um, two people who, who deserve, <coughs> deserve a lot of praise for doing so well. Um, um, Salai in Myanmar and Meshak in Kenya who did a fantastic job in translating um, the discussion, the methodology um, and discussions and, and making them much more real to communities. Um, importantly, what we found, and we weren't sure how communities would engage and the extent to which they'd be able to think through issues around accountability and engage in the accountability discussion, but what we found very, very quickly is they were both passionate about it um, which, in a way, perhaps that should be unexpected. Um, it was very important, and also we're very eloquent about it. Uh, and so, what, what we found is actually that gave us a huge amount of, of input and very relevant evidence to support our assumptions around um, around the link between um, accountability mechanisms and quality. So, so certainly a very willing um, participation. What we had initially tried to do was to isolate the contribution made by using counterfactuals. So with both of the case studies, we had sought to identify um, projects where accountability mechanisms didn't exist, and we struggled to do that. Uh, and so we compromised somewhat um, and tried to, to use villages somewhere there was a... Um, a long experience of using the accountability mechanisms and a fully developed um, package of, of accountability components. The, um, and then we looked at villages where they were either partially um, uh, operating or where there was a much younger relationship, I guess. And, and, and we'd had ambitions around trying to, to isolate um, the, the, the contribution, which was less successful. And whilst there was some, from a quantitative analysis, there's some trends which were um, which which were evident. It wasn't so compelling, and so there's certainly work to do, both in trying perhaps to look at how we can uh, engineer um, a counterfactual uh, and work with that, um, but also to build the evidence base and to to see perhaps if these trends become more compelling as we get greater evidence to to prove or disprove them. Um, and finally, in terms of the methodology, the fact that um, there was success across two very different agencies with very different operating models in very different countries in very different contexts and very different programs suggests that, that there is broad relevance of the methodology to a range of, um, a range of, of, of operating contexts, a range of agencies, and a range of different um, projects as well. And, and that was a, a, a of importance um, in terms of offering up something to the broader um, community. 
In terms of what some of the learnings about accountability itself, um, certainly in terms of a HAP benchmark, whilst trying to find... Conversations about accountability are complicated because different people have very different views around what accountability is. And so what the HAP benchmark gave us was a common language. And I think that was very important, particularly when you then go through a difficult task of trying to measure it, measure quite intangible things. So it was important to have a common language and the HAP benchmark gave us that. Um, that said, it was important to contextualise accountability. Um, accountability um, for a resilience project in Kenya is very different to, the, to, to one um, to a, a non-formal education and child protection program in, in Myanmar. Um, and we, we had quite some discussions about um, how we needed to contextualise contextualize accountability, but also issues around the different operating models impacting accountability. And we talked a little bit earlier about um, for Christian Aid where there is a a chain of, uh, which goes from Christian Aid to the partners, to the CBO, uh, to groups, to members. Um, that's, that accountability chain will have different needs at different links and the importance to, to recognise that and to work um, and to understand it um, uh, and ensure you incorporate it into, into programming. Um, and this, the final issue is, is, is this idea of informal and formal accountability mechanisms. And in one of the case studies, um, there was an interesting scenario where there was a written accountability mechanism, which was a written complaints mechanism, which was very formal. Um, at the same time, the agency had a very good relationship with the community, um, had very good exposure to, made regular visits. And so there was also an informal accountability mechanism, which was really one-on-one, -on -one, people talking to the project officer. Um, and, and, and in a way, there was a risk that the formal accountability was elevated above the informal one, um, when actually, when in discussion with the community, they favoured the informal one um, significantly more than the formal and actually trusted it more and felt, um, you know, felt, felt that it offered them a, a, an easier entry point, I guess. So something around understanding both the formal and the informal, valuing them both, but making sure agencies respond to both as well. And then the final slide really on the, the recommendations, um, which, to be honest, are quite simple. And, and I re reiterate, I'm not, <coughs> there's not necessarily anything here that is, is, is stunning or surprising. It's just having some tangible evidence which we can use to actually um, help us be, be, be more clear about, about what we already know. Um, we know that accountability mechanisms can contribute to, um, to, to project quality and impact. Um, but at the same time, we know that practice is patchy. Um, we know that some agencies perhaps uh, have a greater understanding and commitment to others. But even then, the context make it difficult. Um, so I think the three key issues that come out are firstly, now that we have more evidence, we, we can be that much more assertive that, that we know that accountability me mechanisms strengthen practice. Um, they, they strengthen our ability to, to, to help um, people we, we're seeking to assist. So there isn't really an excuse to not use them. So, the first recommendation really is about um, needing to, accountability mechanisms needing to be more routinely used. The second is around the fact is we know that at the same time they are being used, but what we've, as a sector, what we've not been so good at is documenting evidence, and we need to understand their impact in greater detail. We need to continue to build the evidence base, uh, and so it's important to to really. I would say sort of jump onto um, the, the, the evidence which, which we've begun to create and help build that so we can understand their impact better. And then finally, perhaps a challenge really, as much to the humanitarian community as, as, as others, with the, the rhetoric around the transformative agenda and the key position that uh, accountability to affected people has, uh, I think a fantastic opportunity um, really to use the methodology in, a, 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 in real time in a humanitarian situation um, across a range of agencies, 
potentially filling the counterfactual gap. Uh, and so really a challenge to try and um, use this to, to get real-time feedback um, in challenging humanitarian contexts.